Praise the Lord. Amazing grace. God's amazing grace is the only way that what we're going to read about next is possible. I want to invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to read verses 22 to 23. We have a wonderful intersection today of thinking about the church and also thinking about marriage as we uh, will be having a, an opportunity to participate in a wedding ceremony in just a little while uh, between Paul and Cindy. We have a passage of scripture in which Christ's relationship to the church is the basis for and the pattern for and what needs to be displayed in the relationship of a husband and a wife. We see that. And this is a wonderful opportunity that we have. This is a great opportunity for us to think theologically and doctrinally and spiritually about who Christ is and who the church is and to see how that ought to be lived out in our everyday lives. Now, I know that everyone here uh, is not involved in a marriage, but I don't want you to tune out. Uh, as a matter of fact, the majority of the people in my own household are unmarried. But I want to teach them about marriage. I want us all, we need to all, have the same idea of what marriage is and that it must be based on the Word of God. So Ephesians 5, verses 22 to 33, fitting perfectly in our thinking about the church uh, right now and also helping us to think about marriage, which we will be, uh, which is, of course, on our minds with Paul and Cindy's wedding this afternoon. Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Father, I pray that you would illuminate our hearts and minds to the truth of your word by the power of your Holy Spirit. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I want to just start by pointing out something that I heard the other day on the radio. Uh, somebody had done some study somewhere and they concluded that for for husbands, the number one need that they have in a marriage relationship, or really just men in general in life, they need to feel respect. They have a need to feel respected. And for wives, and generally women, uh, they have a great need to feel loved, to feel loved and, uh, and embraced in, a, in, a safe, in safe and secure relationships in their life, and of course in a marriage like that. And of course, the last verse that we just read, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. See, it's not wrong that the husband and the wife in a marriage get what they need. That's a good thing. There should be a champion in each marriage for making sure that happens. But it's the opposite of what our world would tell you. The world would say, Man, you need respect. The number one thing you need is respect. So here's what you do. You get in that marriage and you demand respect. And you champion your need. You champion what you need to be fulfilled. And you demand it. And you work for it. 
and you evaluate your wife and her value on the basis of how she gives that to you. And that's wrong. That's wrong. The husband needs that and he needs a champion for that. But you know who that champion is supposed to be? The wife. It's supposed to be the wife. The wife's duty is to show up every day for this work to say, this man, in order for him to perform at peak efficiency, and that's, I think that's a good thing, right, ladies? I mean, it'd be better to have a man working at full capacity than a broken man or, you know, with one of the wheels wobbling or whatever. It benefits everybody for you to be that champion. And the same goes for the men, for the ladies. There needs to be a champion in the marriage to make sure that the wife gets the love that she ought to get because God has commanded it that she, she needs. As a matter of fact, God made men and women the way he made them so that a marriage relationship meets the needs. And there ought to be a champion in there for the wife to be loved, but it's not the wife who shows up saying, here's what I need, this is what I gotta have, I will evaluate you based on your ability to give me what I need. No, the wife is the champion to make sure that the husband gets the respect that he needs. She shows up and the husband is the champion to show up every day and make sure that the wife gets the love that she needs. There should be relentless pursuit of these things. And let's admit, our flesh does not agree. <laughs> our flesh does not conform easily to these ideas. I mean, I don't have to work hard. I don't have to have a pep rally. I don't have to attend a sermon. I don't have anybody to help me to think. I got to have what I got to have, and I'm basing everything on that. That's just me. That's my default setting in the flesh. I want this. I need this. Everything re revolves around that. And, and really, that's the basis of any broken relationship. Any sinful relationship I have is when I get myself and my view of myself out of kilter from what God's Word says. I struggle with this. I'm guessing I'm not the only one. I've told you before that I struggle with, you know, when I need to be somewhere at a certain time. It, it is frustrating to me that all these people are in the way. They're in the way. They, they seem to be going out of their way to get in my way. And uh, I just, you know, I'm, how, do these people not understand that I need to pursue my sovereign will here? But I don't have a sovereign will. I have a will, but there's only one who's sovereign, and that's idolatry to act like that. It is idolatry. And so these are deep issues that we have. The passage we read ends at a call for each person in the marriage to have their needs met and that it be championed by the opposite person in the marriage. But the passage itself... Paul, even though he may have been intending to keep things very, very uh, practical in everyday life, he gets into some wonderful truths about Christ and the church. And of course, they're related and he relates it perfectly. But I want us to see that Christ is the head of the church from this scripture. And then I want us to make a marriage application from that. I want us to see that Christ is the savior of the church. And I want us to see the marriage application from that. And I want to see that Christ is the purifier of the church. And I want us to see an application to marriage from that. And the objective in all this is that we together would experience the glory and the purity which has been provided for us and accomplished for us by Jesus Christ. And that we view marriage and really all life as an opportunity to put this spiritual reality on display in everyday life. This is, this is the objective. If, if you go away and you can't remember much, just remember the gospel is true and we need to live it out in a marriage and start working to apply. It's actually not hard and deep. <laughs> it's not difficult to think about 
what would Jesus do? What would he have a husband do if a husband is to love and a wife is to respect? Of course, Jesus is the perfect example of showing respect where respect was due and love, uh, loving others. So let's see how Christ is the head of the church. Beginning in verse 22, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body. OK, there's just a statement. Christ is the head of the church, his body. Ephesians 1.22 helps us to understand that. If you're like me, it's very easy to read that as a theological statement that I've affirmed many years ago, a long time ago. I'm not sitting around struggling. Who is the head of the church? Who? I mean, look at all the arguments. I don't even, that's just, it's axiomatic to me. Of course Christ is the head of the church. But there are great treasures for us. Because that's true. Look at Ephesians 1.22. Ephesians 1.22. I tell you what, let's back up. We've got this long sentence. We'll just start in 15. We'll just start in 15. And we'll read to 23. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints... I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe, According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age but also in the one to come and he put all things under his feet. And gave him listen to this as head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. We do not need to make the fact that Christ is the head of the church, that is, the assembly, the called out assembly of followers of Jesus. We do not need to reduce that simply to a theological or doctrinal point that we've all affirmed. We need to be amazed it needs to dominate our lives. I am a part of the people of God with Christ as the head. But not only that, see what verse 22 says. He put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. Our head is the head over all things. You don't encounter anything in this world or out of this world in all of existence you do not encounter anything that Christ is not the head of this is why we can trust him that's why when we read in Psalm 37 it says trust in the Lord commit your way to him why because he is the head over all things he is at work over all things and so you can trust him it may not be easy because we are in the flesh but this is how we demonstrate we love him. We see him as head. And he's not just head over the church stuff in our lives. He's not just head on Sunday. Uh, he's head over all things and he's been given to us. We get to serve the head over all things. And not only that, the head over all things has served us and continues to serve us. He is even now before the throne of God above, making intercession for us, praying us into heaven. That's what he's doing. He's serving us. And he is the head over all things. Now, if I were going to make an argument that there's somebody who ought not to be serving anybody else, it would be the person who's the head over all things person who's the head over all things 
is not required to submit, is not required to serve, and yet, who is our greatest example as a servant and one who submitted to the will of God? Our Lord Jesus. And yet, He's the head over all things. This is our head. This is what it means when we say Christ is the head of the church. Don't let that be an empty theological phrase. It elevates us to a glorious position. The Ephesians calls it the heavenly places. Who can threaten us when the one who is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion is our head. No one. No one can threaten us. So it simply becomes, our lives become an, a matter of we together are seeking to please Him because of all that He's done for us. That's what it becomes. And I realize I don't have a place I don't get a place apart from my head over, over whom he, he rules over everything. My place outside of Him is the lake of fire. It's the lake of fire. I don't have a place. That's, that's my standing. That's my standing. But my, the head over the church, the head over all things, including the lake of fire was pleased to rescue me from that justice and where I ought to go and instead give me grace and mercy. That's who he is. That's what it means that Christ is the head of the church. And it says also in 23, the church is his body, the fullness of him. Now here's one of those situations that's helpful to me. I've just been told in the word of God that I'm as a part of the body of Christ, the body of Christ is the fullness of Christ. It's what Paul meant when he said, I'm going to fill up what is lacking in what Christ has done in the afflictions of Christ for you. He's not saying Jesus didn't. He got about 99% of it done and I'm going to finish it up and then you'll be saved. He's not talking about that. He means right now the, the ministry the, the lordship, the, the will of God being enacted through Christ. We are the fullness of Christ on earth, empowered by the Holy Spirit and thereby the, the person of Christ because of the, the Holy Spirit. We are the fullness of Him who fills all and in all. This seems impossible to me, I have to tell you. It seems paradoxical. If He is all and in all, then how in the world can I be involved in being His fullness? Why am I involved in being His fullness? It's because I've been assigned that by grace. It's not because Christ was lacking in some way in Himself that, well, He'll be a little more glorious if we add Michael Waldrop to Him. He's not at all. But He has chosen to condescend and in bringing about His will in this world, He is using us and calls us his fullness that's incredible to me I, but the word incredible means unbelievable it's not necessarily I don't believe it it's hard to believe but it's true it's amazing to me we are his body the fullness of him so that phrase <clears throat> Christ is the head of the church we need to understand that it means the one who is the head over all things, is given to the church. Now, if we're a body, if we're an assembly, and here we are assembled, and we know we're not the only ones, there are others who assemble and they claim the name of Jesus. Isn't it better to have a head that we can say, He's head over all things? What if we had a head who was, He's head over the African continent? I guess we'd need to buy some plane tickets, wouldn't we? We'd need to go get in his jurisdiction to enjoy life <laughs> under his lordship. But we don't have to do that. There's no place that we can go that he is not head. 
I praise God for that. But let's make a marriage application here. This phrase that Paul has already introduced in Ephesians 1, now he brings it back in Ephesians 5. And he, he does so in order to give a comparison, to give an example. What is it that he has said that he uses Christ as the head of the church to be an example for? It's this. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. As to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body. Okay. There is no question we have teaching of headship here. And it doesn't matter how many so-called Christians have determined to try to make us more compatible with the world by trying to reword this and rewrite this and rethink this and re-understand it. This is in conflict with our flesh and with the thinking of the world. Let's just admit that. It says what it says. This is what it says. And the, the, the headship teaching in Scripture is not related to culture anywhere in the world. It is transcultural. It is in the purpose of God in creation. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. A couple of things about this verse. <clears throat> It is not demeaning to females that a wife, that the, head, the husband is the head of a wife. If it is, then it's also demeaning to Christ the way God has set things up. And it's not. Okay? If, this is 1 Corinthians 11.3. He just says, and he's talking about, he is talking about a local situation, but he brings an, an eternal transcultural situation to bear on this to deal with what he sees going on in Corinth. He says, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband and the head of Christ is God. Now, everybody here has headship over them except that last person name, God. God the Father in this case. Is headship evil? That's what, if we're dealing with man and wife, that's what our world would tell us. This is, well, it's at least outdated. Maybe there was a time and a place, but it's patriarchal, it's chauvinistic, it is... It is unacceptable. Paul says this is a reality that you need to understand. This is the way God has set up the world. That's, this is a fundamental verse for understanding how does the world work according to God's eyes in an organizational way, in a functional way. The head of every man is Christ. And I have to think that he's speaking here, every man being every believing man. There's a sense in which Christ is the head of every man, no matter whether they believe or not, right? But the point right now is that there are some people, it, it won't solve our problems for us to just go announce this, right, to the world. I mean, we can't just go up to Salt Lake City and say, hey, the head of every man is Christ. And they, oh, now we understand. It's not just that simple, right? There's a sense that, of course, he rules. He's the one we read in Revelation. He claims the keys to death and Hades. He's in charge of, of every destiny. But when we start talking about submission, and that's what the issue here is. Paul is saying, whatever else may be going on, ladies, do not subvert the headship order. In the way you dress, in the way you act. Even if you're participating in a worship service. That's what he's saying. That can't be, that can't be subverted. The head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband. And the head of Christ is God. Now, I imagine that probably some, if not all of them, the men here who have ever been married 
we would probably agree and admit our wives are smarter than us. They, they're smart. That's not the issue. That's not what's being taught. It has nothing to do with value or intelligence. If we were going to do things the way the world does things, then I guess we'd go couple to couple and maybe decide, well, what should happen here? But we're not doing that. We have a command from God. There's a role that a husband is called to play and a role that a wife is called to play. And I want you to see something here. I want you to remember how, how Christ demonstrated the fact that the head of Christ is God. The head of Christ is God. Now let me tell you something. There's no question that Jesus completely agreed with everything that the Father wanted Him to do. He, he saw the truth of it. He never thought, He never doubted. I just don't know if what the Father's will is is best right here. He never had that thought. So, so He, in His relationship to the Father, we have to say is different than the relationship of two sinners in a marriage. But even with that, Jesus did something that he preferred not to do because he submitted to the will of the Father. You know what he did? He went to the cross. He went to the cross. Listen, Jesus was truly man. No man in his right mind would say, you know, I think it's a good thing for y'all to accuse me of stuff I did not do and then nail me to a to a to two pieces of wood. I'm for that. Nobody would be for that. Jesus was not for that. Do you not, do we not realize Jesus understood the injustice of it? He knew. He knew some things. I am God. I created you. I created that tree that you got the wood from this. And you are accusing me. He felt all of that. Of course he felt all of that. And that was expressed when he prayed in Matthew 26. Taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. God the Son, sorrowful and troubled. Now does that mean that he was in rebellion against the will of God? It doesn't means he was truly human he was honest he was what was what were his feelings at the prospect of being held accountable for the sins of all the people of God he was sorrowed and greatly sorrowed in trouble listen to what he said he said to them my soul is very sorrowful even to death he even expressed the feeling I'm not to the cross yet and I'm already in a, a lethal situation here to me, my well-being. I'm sorrowful. He's, he wasn't saying, well, I've got the blues a little bit today. That's not what he was saying. My soul is sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Now, they heard it as, you know, I'm just kind of a little down right now. Because that's, well, how do they treat it? Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that, but man, it's late. And so they <coughs> fell asleep. Going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Do you not know, do we not know that Jesus knew that it was not possible when he said those words? And he said them anyway. Why did he say them? Because he was expressing his heart. This is so we can understand. He did not go to the cross not understanding what he was about to endure. And it was not the physical pain, as terrible as that was. It was the wrath of God that he was about to endure. But he said, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. You. That is submission to headship. 
it seems impossible, but God the Son is our best example, the greatest example of submission to headship. He did something that he did not prefer to do. He knew that it was right. He knew that it had to happen. He was in full agreement with him. He, he was in perfect harmony with the Father in terms of what is the plan of salvation. He did not prefer to do it. He did not call it a pleasant thing. It was not. It was a horrible, difficult thing. For the Son, whose relationship with the Father and the Spirit we could only dream of as the perfect ideal of a relationship. It's, I mean, it's perfect. None of us are able to participate in a perfect relationship. We can only just know it's perfect. So you're not even able, and I'm not able to relate to what it felt to have that relationship torn. This was better and deeper and closer and more righteous and more pure than any relationship any of us have ever experienced. And it was about to be torn because the face of God's fellowship was going to be turned away and the face of His wrath was going to turn to God the Son. He did not prefer that, but He submitted. There was no question that He would submit because He's perfect. He's God. And yet we see his humanity. I do not want this. That submission. We need to understand that when we read this word, submit to your own husbands, it's, it's interesting. The word is only in, the word submit is likely the verb brought from the previous verse. Verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. As a matter of fact, the United Bible Society, Greek New Testament, fourth edition puts verse 21 in the same paragraph as verse 22 separates it from what was above and puts it down with the teaching so that the section would be chapter 5 verses 21 to 33 because most Greek manuscripts do not have the word submit in verse 22 some of them do but the textual critic scholars make the argument it seems like probably scribes put that verb in there like translators do Sometimes for us, and the translators did here in the ESV, and this is pretty universal. Almost all of you, I would say, probably have that word submit or a verb submit in verse 22. There's no, there's no question that the word submit is involved. It's just simply either it is connected to verse 21 and the verb from 21 supplies the verb for 22, or it exists in verse 22, but the the textual manuscript evidence is that 21 needs to be seen in verse 22. And I think that's very helpful because 21 says submitting to one another, submitting to one another. The word submit, though, means to be in the proper relationship of subjection where it's necessary. So the fact that, for example, Jack, who is both my son biologically and he is my brother in Christ. When, we, when I read submitting to one another, it doesn't mean on Mondays I'm in charge and Jack needs to do what I tell him to do. But on Tuesday, Jack's in charge and our house runs according to what Jack thinks we ought to do. That might sound good to you, but <laughs> we're not doing that. We all can see that's not what that means. That wouldn't work, would it? That won't work. Although I think Hope might sometimes charge me with uh, too much mutual submission to the, the little blonde girl that lives at our house. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean take turns making a final decision on issues. It, the word itself means put yourself in the right relationship. Be in subjection to whom you should be in subjection. And that makes 1 Corinthians 11.3 very helpful. The head of the man is Christ, the head of the wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. We submit when we do what we prefer not to do. We need to understand this. When we put ourselves in the proper role of subjection. In the case of Christ and His submission to God, the Father, and in harmony with the Holy Spirit, 
he perfectly knew that God the Father's will is perfect and right. And he did not struggle with doubt about that issue. But we also are to trust God. We're to trust God. When he tells us, this is the relationship I want you to have. This is the way I want things to be. We either trust him or we don't. We have the opportunity to join our Lord Jesus in saying, not my will, but your will be done. Not as I will, but as you will. That's the only appropriate way to do things. And so, Hope and I were, were studying this. She found an article and, and shared it with me. There were, there were some guys talking about submission, and they were saying, really, submission is not, as long as you agree, you'll go along with those that you should be in subjection to. And in this case, we're talking about a wife and a husband. And it's not you maintain <laughs> your position until finally you wear down the person and they finally agree, okay, that's not submission. Submission is I don't prefer that and I don't even agree with that. But in order to honor you, that's your call. It does not, and verse 21 is helpful here, it does not mean that there should not be any attempts to persuade, that there should not be any dialogue. That, and as a matter of fact, a husband is, is unwise when he makes decisions about the family without discussing with his wife. I, I would say that is unwise. There's a difference in what we can justify and what's best. What's best. And so, mutual submission, yes. And this is seen in 1 Corinthians 7, 4, where it says, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. There is a mutual possession, ownership, and a mutual submission in that regard. But there must be a meaning to this word head, headship, and the word submission. And so wives, you are called to submit to your husbands as to the Lord, as to the Lord. But this also brings a responsibility on the husband. We've noted that it is great and wonderful that as a church, our head is Jesus and he's head over all things. And we benefit from that. We benefit from that. Husbands, be noble. Be ambitious. Be enterprising. Be engaging. Be obedient. Don't think that your role, and I had somebody say this to me one time, it is my role, it is my job to keep this woman in line. If that's the sum, if you think that's the sum of your role, then uh, may the Lord help this woman because she's got her work cut out for her to try to submit to a man who thinks that's all. I'm just got to keep this woman in line. No, no, no. Christ has engaged all things. And because of that, he is a blessing and a benefit to the church over whom he is the head. Husbands ought to approach everything that we do in, the, in our lives as a way to bring a blessing to our wives. Not cut them off from that. Not say, that's not for you to know. That is not. What has Christ done? He's called us friends. He's our creator. And he's called us friends. I'm telling you guys, you have that kind of attitude and you'll be easy to be in subjection to. But if you think your role is to keep your wife in line, you're looking at things all wrong. You do have a responsibility and we're about to see that. But it is a loving responsibility. Christ is the head of the church. 
Christ is also the Savior of the church. Christ is the Savior of the church. In verse 23 and 25, we see Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. And then for 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Gave himself up for her. Jesus is the Savior of the church. This is another reason why it's right and good that we be meeting right here as members and as a congregation in a local church. Because if we read Jesus loved the church and gave himself for her, I want to be putting myself in the category church, right? Where, where are the people that Jesus loves and died for? That's the people I want to be with. That's the opposite view of Jesus, I'm going to let you save me. Now, I don't like those people. I don't want to be with those people, but I'm, I'm going to let you save me and be glorified for the fact that I'm on your, on your team. No, no, no. The word church, he, he gave himself for the church, for his people. We, we know that. People miss out by not serving God in a local church because this is the only way to express our membership in the universal body of Christ. I mean, how, there's nowhere else that people are trying to, to obey God like in a local church. where you, There's nowhere else to go. They're not doing that in other places. It's a local church. And they may be varied. We know that it's very varied. We know that there are buildings that look like, that, that there are cathedrals, all the way down to meetings in which people would weep and cry for the thought of having something as nice and good as the meeting we're in right now. I've been in some of those meetings. Some of you have been in some of those meetings. Sat in the dirt and seen people with joy sitting in the dirt too to worship God with other believers. There are people who long for that opportunity. Christ is the Savior of the church. Now, what's the marriage application? Wives, you ought to be able to look to your husbands as a source of help and instruction. And listen to this, the church, even the office of pastor, ought not to usurp the role of a husband in the family in this regard. It ought not. The husbands, you have a high calling here. You should be a source of help and instruction to your wife and to your family in the home. That is the duty that we have. Christ is the Savior of the church. And, and we, the ladies have been told, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. What do they expect here? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. It is your obligation, husbands, to give yourself for your wife. To seek her sanctification and well-being. First of all, of course, her salvation. That she knows what the gospel is. Now, this doesn't mean, wives, that you don't also have a gospel obligation to your husband's. But this is why it is not fitting that a believer should marry an unbeliever. You should not knowingly do that. Now that it happens, and when we read about it in the Corinthian letters, the gospel comes, and it turns out of a couple that are pagans, one of them comes to Christ. Now hopefully the other one eventually is going to come to Christ, but in the interim we've got a pagan and a Christian, and they're married, and Paul gives instruction about that. But we ought not to enter into that relationship willingly, because a wife is deprived of a source of help and instruction if she's married to a pagan. Don't do that. Don't cut yourself off from that. This is God's plan. You need to be able to submit to your husband as to the Lord. You need a, you need a believing husband. We ought not to do that. So let us, that's, that's a practical reason. But let us not fail to celebrate and fail to hold to accountable husbands 
that they be to their wives a source of help and, and instruction. Now that doesn't mean, husbands, that you have to be scholars, but you ought to pursue knowledge of the Word of God because you do have a group of people who have a right to look to you for help. You do. I mean, if you ever have thought, well, I'm not a teacher, but if you're a husband, you actually have somebody that you need to help understand what the Word of God says. You have that assignment. That does not mean that you get to, to lord it over anybody. And there are cases where, of course, where a husband needs to learn more than the wife does. But guys, don't be satisfied with that if you're in that situation. Don't be satisfied with that. Get in a position where you can be a help. So Christ is the Savior of the church. Wives have a right to see their husbands as a source of help and instruction. This is emphasized, uh, by the way, this is not, uh, th this, this is designed to be a part of the intimacy of marriage, as a part of the, the even the, the way that marriage is rewarding to us. Look here, wives, look what it says in verse 22, wives submit to your own husbands. Now this is, <laughs> this is funny a little bit, uh, because the word for your own in Greek is idios. So, wives, submit to your idiot husband. <laughs> but that's not a commentary on the mental capacity of the husbands. That just means your own. The root word of, of idios is uh, I'm of myself, you know, my own. So, wives, submit to your own husbands. You are not called to submit and be in subjection to other men. See, this is a very... <laughs> revolutionary idea actually that the opponents of the Bible have overlooked especially in this culture wives are valued and they are called to be in subjection but to their own husbands not just to men in general so guys let's step up let's step up there Finally, Christ is the purifier of the church in verses 26 and 27, that he might sanctify her. This is a purpose statement that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. And that has a purpose that has a goal so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And that she might be holy and without blemish in the same way. Verse 28, husbands should love their wives. Now, listen. Here's what Christ as the purifier of the church is doing. He is sanctifying us. He is working in us. He is moving away from us the things that are not pleasing to Him. He is separating us from that. We are in the flesh. The flesh is corrupt and we need to be delivered from it. And He's going to do that. But now our pursuit of this brings glory and honor to Him. Our our love of Him and our, our voluntary, on purpose, intentional obedience to Him testifies to the world that He's powerful and He's good and He's right. But make no mistake, He's going to get us to that point. He's doing it. He's the subject of the verbs here, right? He's at work and He's going to present Himself the church. He's going to present the church to Himself without spot or wrinkle. But the process is Christ has given himself for the church that he might sanctify her. And look at this. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. The washing of water with the word. This must mean that God's word has a sanctifying effect on us. And that, with, that, is the way, that is the place where we go for this sanctification, for this cleansing, by this washing. It, it is compared to washing of water. It's metaphorically called the washing of water with the Word. Now we know that this can't be just a literal phrase because, okay, I have the Word of God here, but I, I can't wash myself with water with the Word, right? 
But I can understand, I understand because I've seen the benefits of washing with water in a physical sense. When I apply the word for washing, then that brings improvement in my, in my condition. This is what is to be going on. Men, we are so easily distracted, I am, to think, here are the things that my wife needs. Well, we got to have a house, and we got to have food, and we got to have clothes, and we got to have this, and we got to have that. And after I name some things, I'm tempted to think that's the stuff on the basics. And then also, you know, she needs to be encouraged to have what she needs in Christ. I need to place as my highest priority that she be washed with the Word. Now this is one of the ways it happens to say, family, it's the Lord's day. Let us go hear the Word of God. That's one way of doing it. But you know what? That is not going to get the job done. She needs to be in the Word, and all of us need to be in the Word, much more regularly than once a week on Sunday, right? Who is accountable for that? Who is accountable to see that that happens? It's the husband. In the same way, husbands love their wives, should love their wives of their own bodies. This is what we're called to do. This is what we have to do. Christ has done this, and then the marriage application is husbands. Take responsibility for the spiritual well-being of your household, of your wife specifically. Get the word to her. Make sure that she understands the word, that she has access to the word, that she participates in a study of the word. And so husbands have the responsibility for the sanctification of their wives. Not for personal comfort and convenience. Read the word in your home. Pray with your wife. If you fail here, listen, if you fail here, there is no other area of Christian service available to you. Th that's how basic this is. God cares that much for the sanctification of your household. That's why when you turn to the qualifications of elders and deacons, this is the issue. This is the primary issue. It's not the only one. And so, this is what we're called to do. Now, I hope that after having looked at Ephesians 5 today, you are reminded of the glory of our Savior and what He's doing, what He has done, what He's doing, what He has promised to accomplish as the head of the church and the savior of the church and the purifier of the church. And I hope you remember that and I hope you praise God and see Jesus for all that he is as being the head of all things given to the church. Not just on Sunday, that's Jesus' day. No, no, no. Every day is Jesus' day and he's the head of the church. Think of that. Pursue life that way. Think of Jesus as the Savior of the church. Thank Him. Nothing is more motivating and more humbling to me than when I think on and meditate on what Jesus has done for me as my substitute. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Nothing. You can shame me and guilt me with my obligations and I can admit, yeah, I ought to be doing better. And I can't tell you that it's actually going to make a difference. But when I look to Jesus, I want to serve Him and do whatever it takes. Think of Christ as the Savior of the church. And think of Christ as the purifier of the church. He's not out of control. He's not, there's not chaos that's what the enemy would try to bring, but he is taking all that, he governs all that, and has a distinct purpose in mind in every one of our lives so that he might present to himself the church. And he's going to. He's going to. And I praise God for that.
Those are the theological points. Remember, apply them in your marriage. Apply them in your marriage. Wives, be in the right subjection to this order that God has established. Husbands, take the responsibility that you have. Lead. Lead lovingly and selflessly, knowing that your goal is the good of those that you're leading. That's the goal. Not to celebrate your leadership or stake a claim to it, but to be good and right and produce sanctification, the things that produce sanctification in what you're doing. May the Lord be glorified in every marriage in our church. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Help us to obey. Thank you for describing for us the relationship of Christ and the church and for holding out to us the, the amazing level opportunity that we have to demonstrate the gospel relationship of Christ and the church in our own marriages. Thank you. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we're